often referred to as the father of supercomputing, Seymour Cray founded Cray Research in 1972 with the purpose of building the world's fastest supercomputers, a goal he would achieve in 1976 with the launch of the Cray 1. Seymour was one of the first computer designers to understand that for fast computation you need more than just a fast processor, and the Cray 1 reflected this by having fast I.O. that could keep the processor fed, among other innovations that affected the whole system and not just the processor. On release, the Cray-1 beat every other supercomputer on the market by a wide margin. While there were doubts about what Cray Research would even do as a business when it was founded, the Cray-1 ended up selling 80 units worldwide at close to $9 million each, becoming the first commercially successful supercomputer. A resistant to parallel computing for most of his career, Cray eventually conceded in the early 90s, with pressure from an increasing number of parallel systems coming to market in that period and started work on a massively parallel supercomputer in 1996. He would never see this project finished, however. After his car was struck on a motorway, Seymour Cray tragically died in October of the same year. His legacy in supercomputing carries to this day, with many elements in our personal computers today being derived from Cray's innovations. Last May, AMD announced that it is working with Cray to develop the world's fastest exascale supercomputer, Frontier, expected to be completed in 2021. If we want to understand what personal computers will look like in the next 10 years, there's no better place to look than at tomorrow's supercomputers. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. If you are looking to make your own electronics product, PCBWay offers a custom prototyping service with high quality advanced boards and a quick turnaround in PCB design and assembly. Get 10 free boards with your first order over at PCBWay.com, link in the description. Innovations in computer design like refrigeration, pipelining, massive parallelism, and many others, as well as new algorithms and software applications to take advantage of them, have originated in supercomputers. The belief is that the technology that you put into the fastest supercomputers over time will trickle down into the commercial world. Interestingly, innovation in this field has been progressing at a much faster pace than in any other computing field, but for this trend to continue, supercomputers computers will have to adapt to the slowing of Moore's law, but also overcome some of the performance bottlenecks that are emerging. If I ask you what the biggest bottleneck currently is when it comes to getting more computing performance out of these supercomputers, what would be your answer? Is it the clock frequency wall? Is it Amdahl's law holding us back from taking full advantage of multi-core? Or perhaps memory bandwidth is the greatest deterrent to achieving more performance? While all of these are indeed obstacles, they can each be addressed to some extent as long as you're willing to compromise in other areas. The biggest bottleneck that will change computers dramatically in the coming years is related to data locality and fundamentally energy. You see, with the end of the not scaling and the frequency ceiling that came with it, adding more cores has been one of the last low-hanging fruits when it comes to increasing performance. But that too will reach a limit, both physical and with Amdahl's law preventing the use of cores past a certain number of them. So the situation today is that the scaling on all fronts is reaching a limit, and at the same time, most of the current software is targeting the same machine abstractions that were introduced 40 years ago. So if hardware scaling is no longer possible with traditional means, and software doesn't reflect the emerging changes in extreme scale systems, how can we continue getting more performance, especially at the expectation levels that we've gotten used to? What we need is a paradigm shift both in hardware but also in software. And software developers will have to think 15 to 20 years ahead when designing for new abstractions because it's way too expensive to modify code every time we change the hardware environment. And that will be happening a lot in the next 5 to 10 years as you are about to see. Now before we look at how the hardware and software will change, it's probably a good idea to distinguish between hyperscale and HPC. 
see, as these are the two segments that we will extrapolate from to understand how our desktop PCs will also be changing. So hyperscalers are companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook and Alibaba who run warehouse sized heterogeneous computing systems. So that's servers with GPUs and FPGAs and other accelerators. HPC or high performance computing is where we find supercomputers in. So these are used in places like the Department of Energy or the Department of Defense or in specialized industries that rely on scientific breakthroughs in fundamental physics. In HPC, you will also find heterogeneous hardware environments, typically with CPUs and GPUs, and increasingly with other accelerators as well. So the main difference is in precision. So when Google is serving you emails or when Facebook is doing image recognition, the level of mathematical precision doesn't have to be that high. What matters is the speed at which they deliver data to you. But in HPC, precision is fundamental to achieving accurate scientific results. So when the guys at the Department of Energy who commissioned AMD to build Frontier go to Washington with climate change models, they need these to be as precise as possible, as these influence policies that are put in place. At least in theory, we all know how lobbies are the actual policy influences, but that's besides the point. So when you hear about the compute capabilities of GPUs in spec sheets, for instance, that's what things like FP16 and FP32 are referring to, to the mathematical precision processing capabilities of that product. When we talk about a hexascale supercomputer, we are talking about achieving one hexaflop of floating point operations per second. So that's one billion billion floating point operations per second. Another way of seeing it is a thousand times faster than the petascale supercomputers of 2008. Exascale is around the same peak performance level of the human brain at a neural level. So under this definition, Intel's Aurora will also be a hexaflop system, also co-developed with Cray to be delivered at around the same time as AMD's Frontier, although it's not expected to be as fast. China will likely be the first to have a hexaflop capable machine, probably this year, with Japan following shortly after with their ARM-based Fujitsu exascale machine in 2020. Now, this might look like a dick measuring contest run on a national level by nerds, but the real reason why we need ever more powerful supercomputers is because science is not something that you can solve, but rather scientific models can always be refined. Scientific advancements that might one day save your life depend on having this ever-increasing computational power. Another very important difference between HPC and hyperscalers is that HPC cannot function in the cloud. It needs to be a self-contained unit, usually taking up a warehouse or a whole building, while workloads that run on hyperscalers can be distributed across the cloud. It just so happens that even though the workloads and the environment for HPC and hyperscalers are different, as we've just seen, both have been asking hardware companies for the same types of advancements. This means that there's a concerted effort from all of these parties to advance technology in the same key areas. And it just so happens that many of these advancements will affect us, PC users as well, as we will discuss in a second. It's kind of a perfect storm that will make the economic constraints much easier to overcome because a lot more parties are pushing towards the same objectives. And remember, the Department of Energy doesn't just play around with a supercomputer for funsies. The idea behind these programs is to create algorithms that can lead to advanced models which will then be shared with the United States industry, with companies like Boeing and ATK and Proctor and Gamble, which ultimately helps competitiveness in America and creates more jobs. Now going back to that bottleneck related to energy, if you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll know that moving data around uses magnitudes more energy than actually computing that data. So when we talk about energy being a major bottleneck to improving performance, data movement is where this really comes into play. So if that's the case, then fixing this bottleneck will involve both physics but also architectural changes in processes in the next few years. And going forward, you'll hear companies like Intel and AMD saying they are co-designing their hardware with application developers. But how are they going to overcome this energy barrier exactly? When you look at the power density growth over time, you can clearly see that wall that Anand was pointing to getting reached in around 2005. 
life. The best place to look for an answer to this bottleneck is to look at a company that has been operating under heavy energy constraints for over a decade now, ARM. Because of the size of mobile devices and their passive cooling nature, ARM came up with a solution that I believe will make it into desktops in the somewhat near future and that will probably be introduced in the custom silicon that AMD is making for the Frontier supercomputer. So here's the brilliancy of ARM's low power design principles. Let's say you have a chip that is 389mm squared running at 120 watts and at a frequency of 1900 MHz and then we have a another chip that is 143 mm squared running at 15 watts and at a frequency of 1000 MHz. Because of the relation between voltage and frequency, the smaller chip can do four times more floating point operations per watt than that massive one, even though the larger complex chip has more raw computational power. If we look at an even smaller chip at say 24 mm squared running at 0.6 watts at a frequency of 800 100 megahertz, we get 80 times more flops per watt. And by the way, these are based on real products. Now, if we go down to the size of a core inside a GPU running at 0.09 watts at 600 megahertz, we now get 400 times better performance per watt. So you can probably see where this is going. As we simplify these chips, we are getting a modest decrease in raw performance, yes, but at a massive reduction in area and an increase increase in performance per watt. Makes sense? So even if a simple small core is one-fourth as computationally efficient as a complex large core, if you fit hundreds of these small cores on a single chip at the same price point, you are a hundred times more power efficient at peak. ARM realized this and created the concept of the lightweight core. DARPA, back in 2009, came up with a report which they called Ubiquitous High performance computing, which I'll link to in the description, which had a bunch of recommendations for continuing the computer performance scaling, one of which was related to energy goals, where they hoped to achieve 50 gigaflops per watt at only 20 picajoules per floating point operation. If we chart this magical ideal number that DARPA came up with in a graph, you can clearly see why ARM's lightweight core solution makes perfect sense going forward for more than just mobile phones. The only solution that has even come close to this ambitious recommendation by DARPA are GPU cores and lightweight cores. Heavyweight cores like the ones on Zen 2 or the Skylake ones that Intel has been putting out for years stagnated and will barely change in the next five years with modest performance per watt improvements. So you can see here this top red line is what AMD would refer to as a new processor having 20% more performance performance at the same power, while this red line is when they say a new processor has lower power at the same performance as the last generation. So the desktop chips we buy will barely change in the next 5 years as far as performance per watt is concerned, unless some drastic changes are made. So the first solution for our energy bottleneck is that not only do we need more cores, we need to introduce lightweight cores into the mix. So going forward, we need lightweight and heavyweight cores combined into the same chips in a similar fashion to what ARM has been doing on mobile phones with their big little architecture. But then you might ask if this is the case, why not just make every core small? Well, because not all workloads can be parallelized. For workloads with a lot of parallelism, a solution with lots of tiny cores makes a lot of sense, which is why GPUs have been so popular in the last few years for those workloads that require a lot of throughput. But if the workload doesn't have a high degree of parallelism, then latency optimized cores are going to be more energy efficient. So that's your heavyweight cores. And because workloads are increasingly varied, meaning some are highly parallel and others not so much, I believe HPC processors and eventually desktop processors will become hybrid with both lots of small cores and a few heavyweight cores. Again, very similar to what ARM has been doing for most 
mobile phones for years. And when we look at Intel's presentation slides for their 10 nanometer Lakefield chip, we see precisely this solution, with four small CPUs and one large, more traditional heavyweight CPU. So this helps solve the problem of energy in computation, but not when it comes to data movement. Even though transistors become more energy efficient as they scale down because of the transistor capacitance, copper wires which are used to connect them don't get better efficiency as feature sizes shrink. In other words, even when we go down to 5 nanometers or 3 nanometers, copper wires will have the same efficiency as they do now. So if moving data around costs so much energy and wires are not keeping with transistor efficiency, how do we solve this problem? Well, how about we don't move? data around so much. <laughs> Sounds simple, right? To achieve this, I believe that the next generation of chips will feature a system of data locality management. In other words, data storage will need to have compute capability next to it or even integrated. And in addition to that, we will see another hardware processing unit whose job is to process metadata that will be included in operations. So that when an operation is performed, this this unit will check where the data is stored on the cache and will perform the operation in the right core, be it a large core or a small one. Sounds confusing? How about we put this future chip together and see how this would actually work? So on top of the interposer, we'd have our traditional heavyweight cores, similar to what we have today, for instance, on Zen 2. And these are latency optimized. Then we have our lightweight cores, and these will work similarly to how compute engines work on GPUs. We then have accelerators, which could be GPUs or FPGAs or fixed function for a specific workload with a high-speed bus to access CPU memory. We have our I.O. in the center, and then taking a look at the side view, we would have 3D stacked high bandwidth memory like HBM3 or a future type of similar memory. And because we also need high capacity memory, not just high bandwidth memory, we will have off-chip hybrid memory with both DRAM and non-volatile RAM. Now you might immediately spot a few problems. While on the heavyweight cores, the cache will be equidistant just like it is today, the lightweight cores present a data locality problem. You see, the way software works today, you run a looped instruction and it gets distributed across cores automatically. So the loop iterations are divided evenly across the processes. This is very inefficient, even on traditional cores, but it becomes a much worse problem if you have a multitude of lightweight cores. Because this core over here might get assigned with doing computation on data that is stored over here, which means a ton of energy needs to be used to move that data around. To to solve this problem, we introduce a new model, a data-centric model. So at runtime level, a unit like I was describing earlier will keep track of metadata for each operation that assigns instructions to cause where the data we need is located. So when an instruction requires data that is stored in this call's cache, this new scheduler unit assigns this call or the nearest available call to perform the operation, instead of this distributing the operation blindly and then fetching the data from far away. This means we probably also need some sort of buffer to keep this location metadata in. So a loop will only run where a metadata variable is recognized as being local. This obviously means that parallel loops will need to change in code to accommodate data locality. So that's where this metadata gets introduced in. Application developers will need to code with it in mind. Yeah, it does require work on the part of developers. But once you do it for a loop, you can apply the same logic to all of your loops. And even if systems change in the next 15 years, the programming models will have this inherent data locality built in. With this approach, not only are we able to get a hundred times more floating point operations per watt using lightweight cores, we also reduce data movement massively, which lets us break through the performance ceilings that we are reaching. In practical terms, with this approach, we are looking at a performance speed-up of 
80% over the current models and a reduction in energy usage to less than half of what is currently used. Not to mention that by eliminating these energy-related bottlenecks, we get headroom to continue hard scaling for many more years. Now, why go through all this trouble? Because scientific breakthroughs depend on it. And because for things like photorealistic looking games to become a reality for you and I to enjoy, we need this paradigm shift in both hardware and software. And there's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy here, because these systems will let us create material simulation algorithms that can help us find alternatives to silicon, so that in 15 years time we can have materials ready to replace it, and continue scaling performance even more. Speaking of photorealistic graphics, at this point you might be wondering, how are discrete GPUs going to change in the coming years? Will they still be relevant once we add lightweight cores to these chips? Because we live in an age where the application environment changes almost every month in hyperscalers especially, it's virtually impossible to predict which hardware solutions will win out in the end. Jensen Huang will tell you that it's GPUs, and he might be right. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know that I'm skeptical of this. I hold the view that GPUs are a transitionary tool until this model with lightweight cores materializes, and until the software environment enters a state Stasis. But I could very well be wrong, and maybe GPUs are indeed the future. There's one company that, surprisingly, might give us an answer to this GPU question. While Apple's hardware has become an absolute joke for the most part, the silicon is some of the best in the industry at what it does. When we look at the Apple A4 from 2010, it had less than 10 accelerators. The A8 in 2014 had almost 30 accelerators and the A12 launch this year has over 40 specialized accelerators on chip. Seems to me that there will continue to be a disaggregation of hardware blocks, but they will all be on the same chip, which means discrete GPUs will likely become a thing of the past. Again, no one can know for sure at this point, but that's why things seem to be headed. So it seems that for the near future at least, it's possible that we see both types of special specialization happening, a broader, more generalized specialization using GPUs, and a narrower specialization with accelerators that target just one application. But going forward, these specialized blocks will increasingly be integrated into chips. So there's this interesting trend where CPUs are becoming more specialized, while GPUs are becoming more general purpose. In a recent talk on deep learning, NVIDIA's chief scientist Bill Daly showed off a really interesting prototype GPU that will be coming to the market in the next few months. Remember earlier when I said that to better manage energy, we would need to move to multiple small chips rather than large core chips? Well, the same seems to be happening with GPUs, at least for deep learning applications. Previously, accelerators fabricated on a single monolithic die were limited to specific network sizes. With this multi-chip approach, NVIDIA can scale the hardware to meet the specific demands of the deep neural network. Built on 16 nanometers, these dies use only 0.11 picojoules per op and can be scaled up to 36 chips. Inside each of these chiplets are 16 processing units, and interestingly, a RISC-V IP block is also used here. My guess is that this RISC-V block is used to evaluate weights and distribute them efficiently across the cores. Remember when I said earlier that the software paradigm needs to change to match new hardware abstractions? That's exactly what we're seeing here. The activations sent to the cores, and presumably this scales to all of the chips as well, stay local to where weights are. So just like that model that I was suggesting earlier, here with this MCM GPU, we're seeing metadata being used to distribute the work 
work in such a way that data doesn't have to move around as much and therefore less energy is used. If you've ever wondered why it seems like Nvidia is always a step ahead of everyone when it comes to performance per watt, this is why. They are already implementing new hardware abstractions that are data centric and are very aggressive in energy management because the smart people at Nvidia have long realized that energy is indeed the bottleneck to performance increases. The AMD Radeon group should really pay attention to this MCM GPU because it won't be long until Nvidia uses similar principles on their gaming GPUs. Now as you can probably imagine, this MCM layout itself is a ways away from coming to the desktop as a gaming GPU. Not so much because of the hardware constraints, but because the software environment would have to significantly change to make use of a system like this. Unless either Intel, Nvidia or AMD figure out how to distribute loops in a similar way to what I suggested earlier, using a processing unit to schedule parallel loops at runtime across multiple chips. Can this be done? Well, yes, but probably not cheaply enough for the consumer market. I guess one possibility would be to have one traditional GPU die and then several small chiplets alongside it to do parallel computation. Again, I'm not sure if the economics here makes sense for gaming GPUs, but for other workloads besides gaming, this is exactly where things are headed. And you can expect Intel's upcoming GPUs to look something like this as well, at least the ones that are going to be sold to hyperscalers and HPC. If we look even further into the future, we are probably going to see accelerators for memory and hybrid memory systems, new types of transistors and some pretty insane changes to some of the other things that are holding us back. I suspect that even the file system will eventually go away and be replaced by a neuro-inspired model where data would be managed in a similar fashion to how our brains work. But these are all topics for another day. As a parting note, I was talking recently with someone from ARM and it seems that they have a team of engineers optimizing popular games engines for some of their upcoming hardware. And just last week, a job posting popped up online looking for a game engine tech lead to work on optimizing Unity and Unreal Engine for ARM hardware. Considering ARM's ambitious plans for the laptop and desktop market that I've been hearing about, it looks like that there will be a discrete GPU coming to the gaming market next year, which means we'll go from two gaming GPU makers to four next year. Sounds good to me. I'll be taking a look at ARM in more detail in an upcoming video, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. This video is made possible by my awesome patrons. Join them for just $1 per month and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server, where you can talk to me directly and discuss these topics with like-minded enthusiasts. If you can't contribute financially at this time, then please share this video with friends and on social media as that really helps. Thanks for watching and until the next one.